Hi, I'm Caroline Goodson, and I'm a professor of early medieval history at the University of Cambridge. And I'm here to introduce you to history at university and talk a little bit about what we do in the history faculty, the shape of our degree in history, and a little bit about our admissions process. Why would you choose history as a degree? You would choose it if you're interested in reading, thinking, exploring, and writing about the past, whether that's the very ancient past or the medieval past like I do, or the more recent past. History is a science which advances through the written word. So a huge part of what we do is read the words of other historians and write our new findings into scientific articles or books. Historians then really need to enjoy analysis and crafting arguments based on evidence, uncovering the unknown, but also sifting through how we know what we know. And you should be keen to think about big issues as well as small details. Uh, a lot of the concerns that animate historians are the concerns of the present day. So the environment, gender, justice and injustice, nationalism, capitalism, power, these kinds of concerns, which are, are, are matters that concern us in the present day, also shape the kind of historical inquiry we pursue when we try to understand past societies. History is a discipline that's deeply rooted in the understanding of human societies, sometimes quite different from us in sensibilities, in the languages that people spoke and in the places that they lived, and sometimes quite close to us. Why might you study history at Cambridge? Uh, because of our world leading course, the facilities that are available here, and the particular way we teach here at Cambridge. We offer our students skills which make them quite employable upon their degree completion. History at Cambridge consistently ranks among the top programmes in the UK and in the world. I've given you on this slide the figures from the Guardian uh, University Guide for the past four years in which the history program at Cambridge ranks between first and fourth. Now, these rankings are inevitably somewhat subjective and each uses slightly different criteria. So Guardian uses one set of criteria, Times Higher uses another. You'll need to evaluate which criteria matter most for you when you look at which is the top ranked institution. But the point I'm trying to convey is that the history program at Cambridge and indeed Cambridge University, broadly speaking, consistently rank among the very, very top world leading institutions. This is because the history faculty at Cambridge has an extraordinary range, chronological range, geographical range and methodological range for teaching. It's a very large department. We have experts in a wide variety of subjects. And we have outstanding facilities here in Cambridge, which allow students to work with primary source material and secondary sources, that is, um, the, the, the written work of history about different parts of the past and different parts of the world. And we teach historians here to be historians from day one. So already in their first year, they have courses which are based on the engagement with primary source material. And in their third year, students undertake an independent dissertation. Here are some of the facilities that are available to students at Cambridge. I'm showing you here the earliest preserved manuscript of Bede's History of the English People, which is in the University Library. I'm showing you the archive and modern collection at the University Library with a collection of 16th century rolls from the Diocese of Ely. And I'm showing you here some correspondence from Winston Churchill, which is in the Churchill Archive based here at Cambridge. These and many other repositories of primary source material are available for students for study. The history faculty has a long tradition of path-breaking research. I'm showing you here some recent publications from colleagues who are working in British history and European history. I'm showing you here my own most recent book on urban gardening in early medieval Italy, but many others work on uh, the early modern period and the more modern period, 20th century uh, Portugal and the rise of World War I. And we have colleagues working in world history, that is Africa, the Middle East and Asia. Within the faculty, there are sub-disciplines so uh, a quite famous part of the history faculty is the history of political thought. 
And we also have specialists in economic and environmental history, just to name two. The shape of the tripos in history. Now, tripos is what we call at Cambridge an undergraduate degree. The history tripos at Cambridge is divided into three key strands, historical knowledge, the craft of history and historical thinking. Each of these develops over the course of the three years of the degree. So students in the first year take outline papers, sources and skills papers, and historical thinking papers. Papers are what we call modules or taught elements within the tripos or the degree course. In year two, students build on the skills that they've acquired in the first year, developing each of those three strands with more in-depth, focused courses and more uh, intellectually challenging and theoretically stimulating courses that build on the skills that they've acquired in the earlier year. In the final year, students undertake advanced topics and special subject and a dissertation, as well as historical thinking part two. Here's what it looks like year by year. In the first year, students take two outline papers, which are broad chronological or geographic papers. Uh, they cover a continent or a hemisphere over a millennium, for instance, uh, or in the more recent past, slightly narrower chronology, but still very big geography. And these are taught by lectures and supervisions and assessed by exam. I'll speak more on supervisions in a moment. Students also take a sources paper, which is based in, uh, which is taught through seminars and allows students to engage with primary source material in depth. Students take historical thinking in which they're exposed to two key books of historical uh, writing, one each term in the first year, that are explored methodologically in terms of the process of doing and writing history. In year two, students take topic papers, which are uh, thematic or more narrowly focused in terms of chronology and geography. Students take a research project, which is in part group work in terms of exploring concepts and methodologies relating to a certain subfield of history, and in part independent work, where students undertake original research. There is also historical thinking, part uh, 1b, in which students uh, explore different kinds of historical scholarship, ranging from environmental history to intellectual history. In the third year, students take advanced topics papers or papers in political thought. Um, these are geographically or thematically defined, quite narrow papers that allow students to gain a real expertise. Special subjects are the intensive study of primary source material and historiography in a very tightly focused uh, subject area. These are taught both in faculty classes and in supervisions. And students carry on with historical thinking with the advanced study of conceptual and theoretical and historiographical concerns. Students also undertake a dissertation. Over several months, they carry out independent research with uh, the supervision of an expert in the field of their dissertation. Just to give a sense of how these look, here are some of the, well, here are all of the outline options that we teach for first year. You'll see they're divided into early and late, roughly what happened before and what happened after the 18th century. Um, and you can get a sense, I think, from the titles here of the breadth that these courses cover. Uh, very large periods in very large places with, um, with focused units, uh, topics within each, um, within each option. Here, just to give a sense, are some of the part two options. Here are some special subjects. Memory in early modern England, the 1848 revolutions. These are quite focused primary source and historiographic analyses on, an, on a narrow topic. And there are also advanced topics, which again are, are much more focused than the, the topics of, the, of year two or the outlines of year one, which cover a, um, a, a thematic or a geographical and chronologically specified area, like uh, Africa uh, from the 19th century to the present day, or Stalinism and Soviet life. And just to give a sense, here are some recent part two dissertation titles. 
students can write dissertations on material culture. So the first title is um, the, the Franks Casket. Casket is about an ivory casket that's now in the British Museum and its wider context in 8th century Northumbria. Students can also write on transnational topics. So English and Chinese relations as reflected in a diary or interpretations of the Iranian Revolution in France uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. Teaching is in part done in the faculty and in part done in colleges. So the backbone of study at Cambridge for undergraduates is the supervision system which relates to and intersects with the teaching that happens in the faculty. In the faculty, there are lectures, classes and seminars, much like there would be at any university in the UK. And students learn in groups, sometimes by, by following along to a lecture, sometimes by par participating in seminar discussions or leading seminar discussions sometimes. These are accompanied at Cambridge by very small group that is one on one or one on two or three supervisions with an expert. For a supervision, students will prepare an essay or prepare a body of material to discuss and then spend about an hour discussing with an expert uh, in the subject. These are very intense, they're very interactive, and they are the key um, distinctive element to teaching at Cambridge. Now, the people who carry out the teaching in college-based supervisions are very often the same people who are doing the lecturing or leading the seminars in the faculty, with some exceptions. These two modes of teaching uh, work together, uh, they complement each other in order to develop a real rich learning environment for students at Cambridge. At Cambridge we have outstanding library facilities. I'm showing you here a couple of images of libraries in colleges, so where you eat and where you sleep is really close to where you study. Not all uh, um, libraries and colleges are, are old-fashioned like, uh, like the one at Christ's, some are bright and new like the one at Magdalen. Um, but these are libraries that are stocked principally for undergraduate use. There is also the specialist library, the Seeley Historical Library in the History Faculty, which is accompanied by a number of other specialist libraries. Classics has a library, archaeology has a library, philosophy, medieval and modern languages, Asian and Middle Eastern studies, all have specialist libraries which Cambridge students have access to. And there's the university library, which is a copyright library. That means that anything that's published within the UK, uh, a copy of that is lodged at the university library. So you can imagine that it is a huge collection spanning several centuries, um, most of which is available on open stacks for consultation and to check out if you're a member of the university. History graduates have highly useful and desirable skills. These include clear verbal and written communication skills, which are developed through supervisions and essay writing. They have analytical and numerical skills and critical reasoning skills. That has to do with how we teach history and how we teach students to do history, to weigh and sift through different forms of evidence using qualitative and quantitative analysis. Students learn how to structure an argument uh, because that's one of the critical aspects of advancing history as a field and one of the key skills that we teach students here at Cambridge. Students learn a lot about independent and self-motivation because quite a lot of time is independently reading and studying material. Students have a broad range of methodological approaches to interpreting human societies. So many of us in the faculty use anthropological or archaeological or critical theory uh, lines of inquiry in order to understand the past. And we teach students how to choose a range of approaches for understanding human societies of the past. And students acquire leadership, organization, time management and project management skills from working together in groups and seminars in the faculty or in colleges um, and, and by organizing the different range of activities that they need to do over the course of their degree. 
historians from Cambridge are highly employable. They are enormously sought after by top employers. Many history graduates go to law, to business and finance, to entrepreneurship. Some work in the civil service, some work in NGOs, others work in journalism and publishing or teaching, and some work in the heritage sector and museums. A high proportion of historians goes on to do further study, whether in history or in other subject, and sometimes at Cambridge and sometimes beyond. For everyone, not just historians, there is an excellent careers service here at Cambridge University, which provides a range of employer or careers focused events over the course of students study and provides a, a number of opportunities for engaging with a range of people from different professional backgrounds. And Cambridge, of course, has a very wide alumni network, which students often make use of in order to think about internships or employment opportunities after their degree. A few words about the application and admissions process. As you probably understand, when you apply to Cambridge, you don't apply to the faculty, but you apply to a college. Colleges vary considerably in look and feel, in size, in location, and in, in the number of historians or which historians are there. Students in the history faculty or students who are doing a degree in history work both in the faculty and in the college. So they work with the, the, the historians who are in their college and they also work with the wider community of historians at Cambridge in the faculty. So applying to one college doesn't mean that, one, that you're applying to work with just those historians, although those are the principal historians that you interact with in college. People often ask me, uh, would I have a better chance if I applied to one college over another? Um, because there are different ratios between number of applications to number of places. Um, broadly speaking, there are about three or four applications for every one place, but that changes from college to college. But it changes year on year. And so some colleges have a vast number of applications for very few places one year, and then it changes the next year. So uh, applicants would do well to think about where they want to go, which college suits them, rather than trying to game the system about where there might be a better chance of getting in. The application process is holistic. That is to say, we look at the UCAS materials, all of them, and then we have an interview and sometimes ask for other information. So we look at academic achievement, we look at GCSE marks, and we look at predicted marks or marks attained if you've finished your studies. We look at your personal statement and we look at the letters uh, from your school. We also have an interview and some colleges have an at interview assessment, which usually means they provide something for you to consult right before your interview, a day before or a couple of hours before. And that one of your interviews will be about that thing, whether it's an article or a primary source. And it's an opportunity for you to discuss with the people who are doing the interview what you think about the um, whatever it is that you've read and how you think about what you've read. Other colleges focus instead on uh, uh, interviews based on their, the, the subjects of an A-level study or of whatever you're studying for secondary school or the submitted coursework that is part of your application. It's important to point out that the interview is just one part, uh, sometimes a very um, exciting or um, nervous making part of the, of the application process, but it's just one part of a holistic process. There's quite a lot of information on the link that I provided in the slide about uh, what different um, interview processes there are at different colleges and what's expected. I've also provided here a range of links for further information. The faculty website, which gives a sense of the overall shape of the degree and the other degrees that we offer for masters and for PhD, the community of historians in the faculty, our recent publications, our recent research projects, and the general sense of, of what we're doing. There's a virtual classroom, which provides uh, enrichment materials for people who are studying history at secondary school, both for teachers and for students. 
and this gives some sense of, of the kinds of things that you might do in order to um, test out your interest in doing history and to amplify the material that you've been consulting for your secondary studies. The information on the university website is very good about applying to Cambridge and the process and the dates. And then on entry requirements that are spelled out quite clearly on the, the bottom link. Thank you.